Welcome everyone to another segment of our 2023 spring, uh, the conference and lecture series and also literary readings as well, brought to you by the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute from California State University, Fresno. Welcome to those of you joining us here on a webinar. Welcome to those of you joining us through social media outlets. Thanks to all the groups to who have agreed to carry uh, the event live as well. We're very happy to have uh, with us uh, a poet who I've admired for a very long time. I mean, that's not saying that we're, you know, that he has many years on him. He was just uh, very, very young when I started admiring his poetry. Um, I only had him old. But anyway, Michael Garcia Spring, who is uh, uh, here, albeit not live in person in Fresno State, where we'd like to have him. Uh, present someday. We still are uh, dreaming of a Portuguese American Writers Conference at Fresno State and trying to get some funding. That's something that we've been working on for the last few months and we'll continue and we'll only rest when we can get put, bring uh, about a dozen or so young and not so young and uh, all poets of all um, different uh, age groups and experiences that have some connection to the Portuguese American world, especially here in the West Coast of the United States. So, Michael, welcome to PBBI at Fresno State. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for the invite. My pleasure. Uh, so, Michael, um, of course, uh, I have your wonderful book right here that is uh, the uh, book that's translated that's in both languages, uh, but um, you've been writing poetry for, for a while. Um, I know that... Um, I would like, if you don't mind, just uh, the conversation to begin with a little bit of a bio, you know, for those folks who are uh, coming uh, to this event and uh, who have never or have just heard of your name and don't know much. Who is Michael Spring and a little bit about your connection to the Portuguese uh, speaking world and the Portuguese heritage? Oh, certainly. Um, I was born in, in Hanford, Hanford, California. It's a where my, most of my family uh, lives, and um, and uh, I had a connection to the the, the, the Portuguese community there, Festus, and when I was very very young, and um, and uh, have a great connection to my my uncle in particular, who uh, who helped with the with figuring out our, our family bloodline. It goes back to the Azores this, in the 1700s, and um, but after that, I lived in California for numerous years, and and pretty much in my life, I pretty much split the time between Oregon and and um, and California. Um, I started writing poetry in uh, in high school, and mostly it was just haiku. And uh, I was uh, in martial arts since I was six years old, and um, and you know, pay attention to all the Chinese uh, virtue and all the poems from, from the Tao Te Ching that, you know, that the instructors would hand down to you. I, I was extremely fascinated with that and the show Kung Fu <laughs> with David Carradine. <laughs> and and so I uh, I aspired to write all these, you know, natural uh, wisdom that came down from, from the martial arts. And that's actually where my biggest interest in, in poetry began. Um, I, I wanted to be a visual artist for a very long time. So, and music was a very important um, part of my life too. And so poetry comes together for me, like a, a marriage between um, image and music. And it, with language, it, it does what, what I've always aspired to. So, and so you've been writing poetry since high school, uh, which is yeah. uh, magnificent. Um, and, uh, and for a specific reason, what, uh, when did you, do you remember when you published, of course, your first poem? Um, I think it was it was the it was a, it was a haiku, of course, and mm -hmm. um, it was uh, I was involved in a in this in at that time the, the Sacramento uh, Poetry Center um, and the Chaparral Poets, I believe. I, I can't quite remember the name, um, um, their their exact title, but I entered a contest and got a haiku that. That, that won a prize and it got published there, and and that was that was my my first experience. Going, whoa, okay, this is this is fun. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask, how was that experience? I mean, you know, when one writes and uh, uh, one always aspires to have it published, but sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it happens at a time when when one is not at least expecting it. But 
so being that young, how 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 did you feel? How was that experience to you? And and did that change your trajectory in a way that you know? Okay, maybe I should start doing mm -hmm. this more often. Well, exactly, exactly that. I, I thought, you know, maybe I'll do this more often. And then when I started hitting, when the rejections start hitting, I'm going, oh, wow, this is, you know, like, you know get used to your, fir your first try getting something in. <laughs> and then um, you go for the, you know, maybe the, the higher magazines as, as a, you know, and the rejections, I, I think what I, I wasn't too worried about getting published because you know, it matters is that it made sense <laughs> mm -hmm. that I could write something that really mm -hmm. mattered to me and that, and I could write to someone that, uh, you know, I could give as a gift and, um, and publication was like an, an extra thing, which, um, becomes quite addictive once you start getting published. And so you, you know, submitting is, is a great learning experience because when something comes back and unfortunately, sometimes as the rejection, you read it as if you're the editor and going, Oh, I see why they didn't accept this. <laughs> and then you go back to work on it and realize this is an art form that takes some time and some work. It's not just something that comes from, you know, some voice in your head and it comes down in your first, sure. it comes down right the first time. Yeah, indeed. Um, and I was actually going to ask this kind of at the end, but uh, you led up perfectly to it, which is to some, and uh, we have some uh, Portuguese Americans in, uh, in creative writing courses at Fresno State and, I know some of them will be watching this, if not direct uh, uh, now live, but uh, recorded. Um, what kind of an advice can you give them? You know, other than, of course, uh, hey, there may be a reason why it was rejected. Go to work again, and mm -hmm. and and look at it. But um, some people do get uh, very offended by a first rejection and then just kind of give up, or by a second rejection and then kind of give up. What kind of advice has someone who's gone through that and, of course, has published uh, ever since, um, would you give to someone in a creative writing course, for example, that's uh, going into poetry, that's been writing poetry for a few years and now would like to see it published in the literary magazine or somewhere? Mm, yeah, um, I, I would say stay with it. Know why you're writing and how important what you're writing is about and who it really is to, what your audience is. And um, and don't give up you know, and, and take into account what other people say, but um, know what, you know, it, it's interesting because a lot of people give you advice and and you will try to change it just based on the advice, but sometimes it's something to consider and then take your time and go back to it um, rather than trying to rush it out there. It, it's more important that you get it, get, you know, get the composition right. Indeed. When did you, um, I mean, you mentioned, of course, being uh, uh, growing up in Hanford, which is uh, just a, a little ways here from Fresno State. So uh, growing up in Hanford and uh, a very strong, still today, a very strong Portuguese-American community in Kings County. Um, and having uh, through family that connection. But when did you start incorporating some elements that are throughout your work? of uh, the Portuguese heritage in your poetry. Um, how did that, how did that come about? Mm, um, well, I think just having the connection to you know, my grandparents and, and my great aunt, Jerry, and, and um, who just recently passed away somewhat um, of a, a big loss um, to our family, but she had great stories. My uncle and my mother, would tell me stories, and so it was always in me. And I, I had always aspired to go to the, the Azores someday. You know, um, I'd seen. You know, my grandfather was uh, spoke Portuguese. He rarely, rarely um, um, heard an English word out of him <laughs> during his time. And so I was, I was um, enraptured by the language too. And sure. I was very interested. I never learned to speak it. You know, um, but uh, I, it stayed. It stayed in me, and, and I had uh, fantasies of going to uh, the Azores and and would research things, and and um, I started submitting to magazines like uh, I, I got a Neon right, or Neo. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think Starkey was the publisher, and Correct. And, and I got uh, um, uh, Gamberto Freitas. He he uh, got um, 
I started talking with him and getting some poems published and some translations. Um, he had a class where he translated uh, numerous poems of mine uh, for my first book. And I, I just, I just had this great yearning to go and see the Azores. You know, it's a bloodline. It's, it's, it's something like hardly anyone in my family's, you know, had gone back to once the grandparents had come here. Before we get to that experience of the Azores, um, and if you don't mind, I'd like to read one. Of, or I'd like you to read one of your poems, and I'll read. It, I'll try to read it as, in Portuguese. I mean, I can read Portuguese, but try to. I'm not a great poetry reader, but I do the best I can. Uh, but I love poetry. But um, and I'd like to start, if you're okay with it, with uh, you know some with saudade, which because as someone, as you said, you don't speak the language, but you you grew up around it and uh -huh. hearing these words and and so that is such a as you very well know and and some of those uh following us uh as well those are of portuguese background it's such a unique portuguese word so what what uh, what was it like to write a poem with the title of a language that you know you don't communicate in but it was all around you as you were raised up uh, and and what does that word mean to you so that I mean, oh. you, you describe it perfectly in the poem, I, but you know. yeah, I just, I just, <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, yeah. That that deep longing for the unnameable the, the thing that you you're not sure if you're ever going to be able to, to touch or to see, and um, and so I, yeah, I felt um, that 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 word very deeply. It made a lot of sense. Um, it doesn't seem like there's a word in the in the English language that that quite does. <laughs> Masade does for me. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And so do you mind reading that one for us? It's right oh, actually sure. in the beginning of, of your book. It's uh, on page 16. For those of you, for those who haven't seen the book, this is what it looks mm -hmm. like. And uh, I would highly recommend it, of course. And uh, it is published in Portugal um, by uh, by uh, Compagnia das Ilhas. Um, and, I, and I love the format. I love poetry in this format because... Uh, it's easy to carry around. It's readable. You know, you can put all kinds of little notes on it. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's not a, a super heavy book, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, like some of them are. But, um, and so, and it is available bilingual. So for those who are interested, and in, and we can always put you in contact with Compagnie de Zilas, those who are watching us, send me an email, and uh, we can put you in contact with them so they can get it to you. So if you'll do the honors. Okay. Sade, twelve strings from the roots of anguish stir the ocean, making a nest for the moon. And that is very actually sweet. the title. It's beautiful, beautiful, well done. I mean, just uh, very concise, very well done, very melodic. Um, and that is the title for that we use for the talk, making a nest for the moon, because it's just lovely. Um, so in Portuguese, so that. Doze cordas brotam da raiz da dor e agitam o mar, fazendo um ninho para a lua. And I oh. might say it sounds really good in Portuguese. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> sounds really good. In As those who know the language will, will agree with me. Very well translated. So um, I know that Vamberto, as you said, uh, when he was teaching um, English um, at the University of the Azores, um, and he taught some uh, quite a few courses, including uh, some translation classes. Uh, worked on on some of the translation. But how did, how did this project come about uh, with this book, uh, Dentro do Som or Inside the Sound, which is completely bilingual? Um, tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, um, well I won a, a fellowship at Disquiet um, International, and got a chance to go to Lisbon and. Um, and the first night I was there, uh, a translator approached me who, who had read some of my poems and said she'd like to translate my my some poems of mine. And I was like, I was, I was shocked. <laughs> first first chance on <laughs> on Portuguese soil, and and I, I might have some poems, uh, uh, you know, translated. And I I was just blown away. And it was uh, Maria Joel Marquez, is, and she's. Uh, the one who translated all the poems in the, in the book here. And um, so we started, you know, when we, we start, she already had one that she was interested in. And um, 
we spent a lot of time together conversing about what, you know, what is it you meant here? And she had a, a great obsession with, and she liked the, the way um, my words sounded uh, musically in the English language. And she wanted to capture you know, her interpretation of music and to the, the Portuguese language. And um, so it was very interesting to hear some of her perspectives and how she would change the, some language in, in Portuguese. So I could say it this way, but then it wouldn't work out with the, the end here with these sounds. So I want to redo it this way. And she would ask permission for things like that. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, it was it was quite a thrill to, to hear some of the poems. So. Indeed, yeah. indeed. And they're very well done. They're very well translated. Um, she did a wonderful job. Um, uh, uh, Natalia Correia, the famous Portuguese in, from the Azores, uh, but mainland Portugal, a Zorian poet whose um, centennial we're actually commemorating this year, was born in 1923. She used to say that uh, there's uh, uh, poetry is uh, untranslatable. It's only reinterpreted. <laughs> and uh, and I think she's right because, uh, <laughs> and uh, good poetry, especially, of course. And uh, because I had the the pleasure of which we'll read lastly if you're okay with it which is uh, your poem from your chapbook uh, Sunani and I um, I translated it and it's uh, you know it's just there's yeah. some things that don't make sense well they make sense but they don't uh, they have the same lyricism the same musicality uh, unless we change mm -hmm. things around to make it you know more readable and more and give it give it the as you pointed out, give it the 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 music sense and and give it uh, that uh, that lyricism that you do so well in English. So um, let's uh, let's go to Fadu because you mentioned you just yeah. had arrived in Lisbon and you you know here yeah. we are going to translate you know some poetry and you can't talk about Lisbon without Fadu, which I'm sure I'm gonna I'm sure I'm not sure, but I'm gonna ask you: Did you have the experience of listening to some Fadu? Oh when yeah, you went there, to, when you were there and for this school. Oh yeah, yeah. I went to the Alfama district and went to the museums and you know I've already uh, had, had, had listened to, you know, had already listened to music uh, you know before I went and I I, I love Fadu and um, so to go there and experience the cafe with the you know the tables thrown out onto the cobbled streets and and then go in and listen to the, the music live was. I, I have never experienced that before, and it was, it was incredible. I, I the Portuguese guitar is something I've always been in love with, with its sound. Yeah. yeah, and even in any Fadu house, they seem to be all good with that instrument, don't they? I mean, yeah. whether it's a great Fadista or just a Fadista from around the block, they mm -hmm. they know how to master those the, the instrument. Yeah. 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 So, to, so read if you don't mind the the okay. the a little bit longer poem, but a beautiful one. You talk about all that that you just mentioned. Uh, yeah, in, in I did. Fadu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, and kept trying to capture you know the the, the spirit of Fadu, you know, which is the the, the Sadeid also um, of Fadu, with lost love, the Portuguese guitar soaks in a bathtub on a rooftop pours himself another glass of vino virgin, then salutes twilight's last bawling goal in a sky heavy with clouds. Orange earth tones of rooftop tiles give way to the darkening blues of cobbled streets. The guitars can hear cafe chairs scuffling, the alley below with laughter and voice and ice clanking in glasses. Garlic and salt rise into the belly of air. Octopus sizzles on the grill. The guitarist knows it's time to climb out of this bathwater and tune the strings. Tonight, Severa will sing Fadu. The moon will emerge from the haze of the Tejo River. And because of Fadu, because it embraces fate and despair, the guitarist will sink into sound. He'll become the enchanted fisherman once again, casting his interpretation of nets and hooks into her songs. Very well indeed, uh, very, very well captured. And um, so here it is in Portuguese uh, for those who are following us who do not or may know both languages. De amor perdido, o guitarrista português mergulha numa banheira no terraço, 
serve-se de mais um copo de vinho verde. E saúde o guincho da última gaivota do crepúsculo num céu carregado de nuvens. Os tons alaranjados de terra das telhas cimeiras dão lugar à escura melancolia das calçadas. O guitarrista ouve as cadeiras dos cafés, inquietando-se, a viela lá embaixo, o som das gargalhadas e das vozes e o gelo tinindo nos copos. Alho e sal sobem ao ventre do ar. O povo sibila na brasa. O guitarrista sabe que chegou a hora de sair da água do banho e afinar as cordas. Esta noite, a Severa vai cantar o fado. A lua surgirá da neblina do tejo e pelo fado que abraça o destino e o desespero, o guitarrista irá afundar-se na melodia. E uma vez mais torna-se pescador, encantado, lançando os seus acordes de redes e anzóis à voz da Severa. And she did a oh. wonderful job in this translation, Michael, because um, one of the one of the toughest things to translate there at the end, and in, you know, when you have his interpretation of nets and hooks into her songs um in portuguese it's very hard to say i mean it's it's into her songs as, uh, as canções dela and she just chose the word voz which made perfect sense here and um and she repeated the word severa which is an icon and the portuguese understand from top to bottom from side to side <laughs> and so uh congratula congratulations uh indeed uh to uh, to the translator to maria joão for for this very very fine translation oh that's great to hear it is it is wonderfully done it is uh it is a magnificent reinterpretation and so um you said you you've always liked fado or you like fado so you knew fado before you went to lisbon i mean it's something mm -hmm. that, it's a music genre that you have heard before mm -hmm. uh how does how does that how did that happen how do, how does uh, one you know raised in america in your case so was your grandfather that was spoke portuguese or your third generation um uh, from one side of your family and and how how does one how did you get how did fado come to you or how did you get, go to fado Oh, yeah. Well, I've always been a music lover and, and jazz has been a very big deal to me. And um, I I probably, I'm not sure how to pronounce um, his name correctly, but, but Carlos Paredes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, Carlos Paredes. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's, he, that's, that's, he was um, he was amazing with, the, in, you know, when he incorporated and, and did some fusion with jazz and That was the first time I actually saw the Portuguese guitar in, in film, and oh, mm -hmm. and, um, and of course Amelia, um, I've, I've heard her um, had some tapes, and and my mom has talked about um, certain um, musicians and and in music, and 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 I, I think I just sought it out on my own from there. Interesting. And so your your mom would talk about these this music genre as well, which is interesting because she was already born in the States, obviously. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> It's so interesting how the music and how through music and in this case poetry as well, um, it can carry on from generation to generation. Yes. Do you do you do you find when you write because you write about you know many different themes, uh, most of them Uh, around uh, not just, of course, identity, but uh, around, you know, uh, social justice and around, you know, uh, uh, the environment and many other themes in your poetry and um, all of them concerned with uh, with our existence and our respect for, for, for every for everything and everyone. When you when you do a poem that's kind of you know in your identity like soldados or like fado because of your experience in Lisbon, um, how how does how do you feel about that? How how important is it to you to touch upon your identity when you do some writing? Oh it, yeah, it's extremely important. I feel like I, I'm making 
some kind of inner connection with my my ancestors, <laughs> and um, and I and I do the same with the I'm also have you know I, Irish and Choctaw who I identify with too, and I have written poems in those directions too, but this uh, this the trip to uh, Portugal and and then to the Azores was you know is, is I have now all this Im imagery and and uh, sounds and senses that uh, just stirring inside of me. That, makes it easier to, to write about. How important was, it was indeed that trip and how important is this, this, how important to you was this program with the squad? Tell us about it because uh, of course with the pandemic, it, it had to be um, mm -hmm. kind of put on hold for a couple of years. I believe it has restarted, but uh, um, I've always been a firm believer that uh, the f flat has helped tremendously, but not just flat. I, think that the Portuguese government actually should have a bigger uh, not say so in the direction of disquiet but a bigger role uh, in economically supporting uh, disquiet and economically supporting especially the writers who have some kind of connection to the Portuguese world whether it be you know a quarter a tenth 25 percent uh, or 30 or 40 or whether it be just you know first second third or even fourth and fifth generation so what, it, what, what, what tell us a little bit about how the that program uh what it played uh on your poetry and on your connection to to the Azores and to Portugal oh I, I thought it was great I, um one of the workshops that I I, I took was uh, uh from Catherine Vaz and the Luso American experience and and it's, it's very interesting how many people that are basically my shoes who who um, had grandparents who might have lived there and, um, and no one else has, has, has gone back to live. And, and, and it, it seemed very interesting because it's a huge group of people, us Luso Americans who just are driven to go see and experience the place of, um, of our bloodline. And, um, and, and somehow I'm, that's, that churns inside of me. And I'm not sure if I can necessarily explain it, but Disquiet did it was just a great program and exposed a lot of, of uh, universalities between the world and, uh, and and through you know its culture and um, and and part of that trip too, which was a very big deal to me, was that I get a chance to finally meet Bimberto. Um, face to face, <laughs> and, and he encouraged he encouraged me to submit to disquiet and and then if we do that you know if, if i if i get there that i have to come and and visit him and and then go see my ancestral islands which is pico and final mostly <laughs> correct indeed and so how important also in the disquiet like you said there's people from various different experiences but how important to you and and you felt to uh, your colleagues who were Americans uh, of Portuguese ancestry uh, to to have this connection with someone else because sometimes you're writing a poem or you're writing uh, or if you're writing fiction or if you're even writing creative nonfiction you're writing and if you're in an isolation uh, kind of you know and you don't have this direct contact with other people sometimes you you think am I doing this you know, am I being too emotional on this end, or am I just bringing in some elements that may not be the right elements for it? How important to you was this contact, this camaraderie among people who have this common ancestry at different levels, obviously? Um, I, I, yeah, I felt a little isolated in, in my thoughts with this, and and um, you know, talking with Van Burrow, he, he he told me that there, there's there's numerous people who are, who are, you know, who feel the same way. And he had written um, a, an article on the experience and I, I paid attention to that. And so to, to finally, like, you know, be able to uh, have contact and, and have conversations and, and, and see this, uh, you know, this, this common thread that, that we feel was very, was very, was very important to me. Um, I, I like that I like that people have the same ideas or they had different experiences or came about it in a different way like they're just interested in 
learn, learning their bloodline and then they got fascinated with the stories and the culture and the no idea. <laughs> Indeed, and it's in, and so interesting how you were saying that uh, when and you, as a young man um, here in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, your contact with, of course, uh, with your grandparents, with your uh, aunts, with your mom, with other family members, how there was always, a, I may be putting a word or, or two in there of what you just said a few minutes ago, but how there were always lots of stories. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I'm always, uh, students always tell me, it seems like, the Portuguese can't say something directly. They always have a story about it. <laughs> yeah. That's but true. We do. But we do. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't mind, let's, um, if you would like to read Fado Café, which is in kind of the same continuation, oh, but a little yeah. bit different. And it's, <laughs> Much uh, earlier. Yeah, yeah. I wrote this um, before I ever... Um, was ever on Portuguese or Azorean soil. <laughs> so you wrote this one before you were there? Mm -hmm. Just um, from your experience with the Fado music? Yes, and yeah, exactly. Uh, Fado Cafe. In the cafe, a man held the Portuguese guitar, the body of Lisbon, the 12 strings his fingers emulated rain. Across the room, a, a woman began dancing the finger picking in Fugueto described her movements, the underwater sway of seagrass. Her shadow drifted through the welter of candlelight on the adobe walls. I was submerged. When the song's final chord floated across the room, I realized the dancer had disappeared. I placed a grape between my teeth, tasted the dark surge of juices. Wonderful. Here it is in Portuguese. Fado Café. No café, um homem empunhava a guitarra portuguesa, o corpo de Lisboa. Com doze cordas, os seus dedos imitavam a chuva. Ao fundo da sala, uma mulher começou a dançar. O Didelar e Figueto descreviam os seus movimentos, o ondular submarino das algas. A sua sombra vagueava pelo trepidez delirante da luz das velas nas paredes de tijolo. E eu estava esmagado. Quando o acorde final da canção ecoou pela sala, apercebi-me de que a bailarina tinha desaparecido. Pus uma uva entre os dentes e saboreei a escura onda de nectares. Mm. Wow, that sounded great. <laughs> it, it's Portuguese, but I don't know how great it sounded, but it's a great poem. And again, mm. once again, Maria Joan did a great job on, on the translation uh, by substituting some things that in Portuguese it would, it is, um, it's uh, again, uh, restating Natalia Correia. It can't be translated, it can be reinterpreted, but she right. reinterpreted, I should say this for those who are following and those who are going to be read it, reading the book and hopefully all of you read English. It's, an, it's a, you know, there it is in English and you can actually learn uh, from uh, to some Portuguese because it's very well done. Um, she reinterpreted, but she was loyal to the, to the, to the poem. That's what's important. I think from, from my experience translating, one of the hardest things to do is to reinterpret and still be loyal to what the poet is trying to say, because you don't want to say something else. At least I don't. I want to say exactly uh, whether I'm translating to English or to Portuguese. I want to say what that poet has said. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, it's not up to me. <laughs> I didn't write the poem. <laughs> and so um, even, even, um, even if there was something I didn't like the way the poet did, which had, hasn't happened because I only translate people I like, uh, so that's kind of makes it easier. But <laughs> <laughs> but the even if the, if it, that happens, one's role in translation is not to be, as you know, from the Latin, you know, traductore traidore. It's not to be a traitor. It's to be loyal to the poem, and sometimes that means reinterpreting it and changing words around and things like that. So we're gonna go to approaching the Azores, which is one of my favorites. Um, but before that, so this uh, this quiet afforded you the opportunity 
to be in Lisbon. So, hey, you know, it's only a couple hours. Why not go to why not go to the Azores? Uh, why not see Vamberto and he'll tell you everything he wa- he'll tell you. Uh, he's a powerful man in a lot of ways. <laughs> yes. My friend since I was 19 years old, so I can talk bad about him, <laughs> but I never would. Uh, Vamberto and I have had our, uh, our all of our ups and downs, but most of them have been, we have a very, very strong um, friendship that has lasted, well, that's lasted uh, 40 plus years. So, um, um, but, um, and, uh, and I'm sure that was important because you and him had been communicating. He's a fan of your work. I know that. We've talked about you many times. Um, Humberto has done an excellent job in promoting Portuguese-American writers in the Azores. I don't think anybody would be known in the Azores uh, if it wasn't uh, for Humberto's work, you know, uh, promoting yourself, promoting all of the other writers, um, the ones who are writing now and the ones who have been writing for 20 plus years. Um, But how was this contact, especially with Piku and Fayal. Oh, yeah, that was, uh, that was quite quite magical because I've, I've, um, I've heard the stories from my, my uncle and aunt and grandparents and you know, that these were the places I, I it, it, was, it was just a name to me. You know? mm-hmm. and, um, and of course, all the things I looked up and all the images, you know, I, I had no idea what it was going, what the experience was going to be like, you know, and, Landing on the island, you know, is, is you know, I land in on Fayel first. And, right. Yeah. Did you take the boat over to Piku? Yes. Yeah, and that was that was that was its own experience. I got to Fayel, I you know, it was more more festive than the little shopping center, and I, I had great time in the ca- cafes, and you know, I had my my ritual of um, of tarts and coffee every morning before I wrote. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and but when I took the ferry to Pico, it felt like I was like, like I was getting ready for some, you know, like oh, this is a, this is a, I'm gonna have touched two of the main islands that based on I, that I know of my most of my bloodline was gone to, and and um, and when I got to Pico, you know, uh, there was a jazz, there was a, a jazz group playing. I was going, oh, okay, I'm right at home here, <laughs> <laughs> and I listened a little bit, and you know, had some coffee in the in the um i didn't know what i was going to do i just wanted to i i didn't have i didn't rent a car mm-hmm. i just went across i was just going to walk around madalena and, and um and i decided to start walking the streets and i i i walked um almost the, in, the entire side of the island i walked for about four hours i don't want to, i wanted to take in every scent and smell and sound and wow. stop stop at little coffee shops you know or, or or restaurants, and I had a mill, you know, and and I'd walk a little further and get into where all the um, where all the where the where all the great you know the, the vineyards were, you know, and I just loved the architecture of how um, how houses were were vaguely born from the volcanic rocks and plastered, and I saw familiar sites of uh, um, living roofs and you know. And, I, yeah, it was it was very magical. Um, it was very important that I I walked. I didn't. I wasn't driving from one destination to another. I just wanted to just. You know, I had a good pair of walking shoes at the time. <laughs> sure, sure, well, and that's wonderful. That's the way to really, as you said, to take in the sights, the smells, the uh, mm-hmm. uh, the the colors. Piku uh, yeah. has uh, that beautiful basalt dark black Mm -hmm. contrast to all the greens and uh, and uh, to me it's uh, i've had the good fortune of seeing all the islands and um, and it's one of my favorites actually my second favorite and my first favorite is not to say where i'm from as uh, (laughs) my to say to friends like to tease me one of my favorite is flush my favorite Mm -hmm. island actually as far as you know natural beauty but piku just has this majestic feel to it doesn't it Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah Let's have something to do with that big old mountain right now. Yeah, that mountain just is <laughs> is very majestic. And how and 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 of course you touch on this poem as well. How hard it was for those people to make a living and to and to change that very hard basaltic rock into something that uh, you could you know plant vineyards and you could cultivate potatoes and 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 other things that you needed. So uh the people of 
Piku, um, of all the people of the Azores, had really, really um, a very hard life for, for many, many years. It's all changed now, but I'm talking about, of course, in the uh, 15th and 16th centuries and 17th century, it was a very, very hard life in order to make that island cultivatable because it's it's all basalt just about yeah yeah and and so did uh, did uh, the so you spent as you said four hours just basically walking all of the uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of then, the, then uh, i had to take a taxi back so i didn't miss the ferry back to <laughs> because that's where i was i still had a couple nights in a hotel there <laughs> <laughs> wonderful so that was kind of uh, like as you said that was kind of, of a magical and a mm -hmm. and a and a and a, a um a high point in your visit to the azores the people yes. in Fayel. definitely uh did you sense a fee, uh, some kind of a connection when you were there with the yes yeah and um although i didn't have as much time uh, in piku that i wanted um i I did, we did get a chance to come back and um, climb Mount Pico on my, on my 55th birthday. So oh, <laughs> was fantastic. So you went back to Pico. I came back, yeah. And I spent most of my time on Pico. This, the first time was Fiel. Mm, okay. And, okay. So you've been to the Easers a couple of times now. Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. And Disquiet, once again, was uh, was uh, very helpful. Was, I, I had a residency in, in 2018 and brought me back to San Miguel. I can see Vamberto and everybody again. <laughs> oh, when was the first time you did this quiet? The second time was, was 2016. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So two more, two years later, I came back and then I spent more, more time in Piku. Yeah. Well, it's, it's time. And it's time also that the Azores does something to bring all of you together in the Azores. We'd love to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's uh, let's uh, if you don't mind reading approaching the Azores, uh, because, uh, that, uh, has of course, Piku is there, you know, in a very, yeah. very strong way. Yeah, and, and this one, um, to, to note that uh, it, I, this was a poem I wrote that uh, Vamberto originally thought I had been, already been to the Azores when he read this poem. And this was one of those others where I felt like I I channeled the, my trip there and then wrote this poem. That, you know, I was trying to manifest my way there at this <laughs> point. And um, so... So this one was written before I showed up, but it very, it's, it's very much what I felt when I got there. Okay, I'm approaching the Azores. Finally, the goals like fat moths float from the basalt cliffs. I stand in the whiplash winds full of salt and sting. One hand shields my eyes, and the other grips the schooner's railing. I'm finally looking at Piku Island and its mountain peak rising out of the mists and clouds. The friggy, Fregazias and below the mountain, the clusters of houses, the Fregazias and Adegas, the rocky ledges, the harbors, the colorful fishing boats, my ancestral home. I'm standing on a surging deck in the smell of grease and fish, where the slick boards below my feet creak as I shift my weight under a flapping sail. I'm leaning toward the island, squinting for perspective over the blue green map of water. It, it's amazing that you wrote this before you were there, uh, because uh, you know it's uh, it's like uh, as you said, I'm sure that as you approach the Azores and as you approach Piku, you've you, all of these things came uh, to your mind because uh, it's it's a wonderful um, a wonderful tribute to arriving at a place and actually feeling that place, although you had never been there, and that is also. Uh, you know, always amazing when we had a poetry reading here with a few of your colleagues, Portuguese Americans here uh, during the pandemic, I think 2020. Um, there was a young man who is a singer in the Azores, Christophan, who actually sings in English uh, folk songs. Uh, most of his creativity is in English. And, um, and when he he was invited through our mutual friend, Scott Edward Ederson, to, to be on with us. And um, after everybody read a poem, then he played a song. And he said, are you sure you guys have never been to the Azores? <laughs> because you guys are writing about this like you were here. <laughs> and there's a couple of the poets had never been to the Azores. <laughs> and this is the same thing. So here it is. Chegando aos Açores. Finalmente as gaivotas e como traças gordas flutuam das falésias de basalto. 
enfrento o golpe dos ventos salgados e ardentes. Com uma mão protejo os olhos, com a outra apoio-me na balaustrada da escura. Vejo finalmente a ilha do pico e o cume da montanha, elevando-se para além de neblinas e nuvens. E sob a montanha, o amontoado de casas, as freguesias, as adegas, as rochas à beira-mar, os portos, os barcos de pesca coloridos, a minha morada ancestral. Estou no convés sinuoso, por entre o cheiro de gordura e peixe, onde por baixo dos meus pés as pranchas rangem ao deslocar o meu peso sob uma vela ondulante. Inclino-me em direção à ilha, semicerrando os olhos para ganhar perspectiva sobre o mapa de água azul turquesa. Wonderful poem. Wonderful poem. It's amazing how it was written before you went there and it just... Um... It's also a testimony to, um, and, a, and a testament, I should say, to, to the storytelling that your family gave you. Because they made you feel the Azores without being there. Yeah, those are, those are great ancestors. So um, I, uh, we're coming up on the end of our hour. And I want to, of course, thank all of those of you who are joining us. Thank Michael for this great conversation and poetry reading as well. Congratulate him on his work. Uh, what are you working on? And if we may know, is there, I know that you just had a chapbook not too long ago, and we're going to read the poem from that. But uh, what, are, what, uh, what, what is occupying you in the world of poetry right now? Oh, well, um, well I, I, I have a, a boat now. It's a nautica. It's a, it's a motor sailor, 33 mm. foot. And I spend a lot of time with a uh, partner, uh, Jasmine Blue. And uh, so I have a lot of poems that are, you know, take place and, you know, Uh, take off maybe from the harbor uh -huh. <laughs> in Brookings mm -hmm. since we're, we're, we're moored. Um, and beyond that, uh, sometimes I, uh, where, where there's a quote, I'm going to maybe jump into this, um, is by, I believe by Charles Simic, who says uh, that the images are smarter than you are. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's what you follow, right? And something like that. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's kind of what I do with my writing at this mm -hmm. point is, But I'm taken off from the subject, like you know, I'm, I'm approaching my my sixth decade, and so I want to um, find experiences from that you know point of view, of approaching that maybe like approaching the Azores, but approaching this you know important year and and beyond. And uh, and of course, that brings up a very good point. That I like to ask your poetry, of course, has changed over time from that you know original poem when you were in high school to what you're writing today about your experiences, you know, in the water, taking, you know, in the harbor and, 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 uh, and, and, and looking maybe at a, at a, at a leaf different than what you looked at when you were, you know, 20 or 30 and, and, and at the water and at the peace of, of, of nature. Um, do you feel that there has been change even in the last uh, 10 to 15 years in your poetry? Um, yeah, I, I believe so. Um, At one point, I would just write anything down and just, just like, a, a, you know, maybe more like, maybe it's more like jazz where, you know, but I think it's in the music. I, mm -hmm. I think I write a, a slower music now and, mm. and, and, um, and more contemplative, maybe um, chiseling a little bit more with, with, my, with my poetry than I did in the beginning. And, and it, feels, it feels good. It, it seems... Um, You know, as I as I get older, that the mood changes, and uh, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to match that music of that age and and my senses. Indeed. So in, in that sense, that's where it's gone. Well, we're going to end if, uh, uh, as we had talked about it with uh, with this poem, tsunami. Um, that uh, is actually for those of you uh, that follow PBBI at California State University Fresno and. Some of the things that we do know that um, I've been working on an anthology. Actually, the anthology is at the publisher right now. So it is in Ponta Delgada at Letras Levadas. Um, and it's um, it's uh, titled Into the Azorian Sea. 
And um, that's a line that was authorized by Lara Goulart, who's uh, here with us on, on the webinar. And, um, and so um, it, it will include, it's basically a bilingual uh, anthology. It will include uh, poets, uh, as what I call Azorian poets, whether they're Azorian American, Azorian Canadian, or Azorian Azorian <laughs> living in the Azores. So my thought was to include Azorian Americans uh, and Azorian Canadians um, because to me the Azorianists as you just have proved and others have as well is here and alive even in second third and fourth generation um, as you have, as you have shown us by some of the poems that you wrote before you even went there and so uh, it's kind of um, I, don't, I don't know exactly what the term would be but I feel good about the product not uh, you know just about the translation but about having an an anthology a bilingual anthology that includes 103 poets and about 40 of them or i think 30 something are from the united states and canada don't live or, and from mainland portugal they don't live in the azores although they're azorian and so mm -hmm. that just shows that the azorian spirit as we said earlier is uh, is beyond the archipelago so be coming out and that it includes this poem translated to portuguese so if you don't mind reading it in english and i'll i'll try my 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 translation which is not as good as my usual but uh, uh but i worked hard at it <laughs> okay great and um it's from my newest chat but i'll just send you a copy then the color window i love the artwork and it is great um, it is great we won the james tate prize from uh, sir vision which is out of ireland and absolutely a, th a thrill to have that and, and, and as much of a thrill for you to have translated this poem that's part of this. Um, this is Tsunami, which is, you know, in part, <laughs> this is one of the poems that come off of that, uh, that take off from being around the harbor so much and observing, you know, wildlife like the sea lions. I think the sea lions would like this uh, poem. <laughs> they certainly would. <laughs> <laughs> Tsunami. The boats, broken from their moorings, look like drunk horses trying to find their way around the docks. But the docks come undone, too, as the water rose so subtly, no one seemed alarmed. Several miles of rising water still coming as the boats bang against other boats and floating cars in the parking lot. And here they come, a pride of sea lions, flipping around in the water. They are thrashing the surface, bumbling over boats, tipping them over, catching a ride on the floodwaters toward the sinking fresh fish market. They're dunking cars along the way, barking, howling as they bounce, blubber over metal. They've waited a long time for this. It's a beautiful poem. It's a powerful poem. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, uh, the sea lions would like it, and I like it very much as well, because they actually deserve this moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so here it is in Portuguese. Tsunami. Os barcos quebrados dos seus ancoradores pareceram cavalos bíbados a tentar encontrar o seu caminho em torno das docas. Mas as docas também são desfeitas, enquanto a água se elevava tão sutilmente, ninguém parecia alarmado. Vários quilómetros de elevação, a água ainda a chegar enquanto os barcos batem contra barcos e carros flutuantes no parque de estacionamento. E aí vêm eles, um bando soberbo de leões marinhos a dar voltas na água. Estão a bater na superfície, a cambalear sobre barcos, a incliná-los, apanhando uma boleia sobre as águas inundáveis, rumo ao mercado do peixe fresco naufragado. Abundam carros ao longo do percurso, ladrando, uivando, à medida que saltam, borbulhante sobre metal. Têm esperado muito tempo por isto. It's a lovely poem. <laughs> oh, it's been an honor to hear you know, and, and very powerful, and, uh, and I'm certainly with the with the sea lions on this one. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Michael, for this hour with us um, on behalf of the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute at uh, Fresno State. We appreciate uh, your time, and above all, uh, we appreciate the conversation, and mostly we appreciate your poetry today and, and always. So. 
Uh, a million thanks to you. Uh, a million thanks for always incorporating uh, some somehow in your poetry, even the ones that don't talk about the cafe or the ones that don't talk <laughs> about approaching the Azores. I've read the book a couple of times uh, and I have have a lot of, uh, or the one who doesn't talk about, you know, the, uh, the, the that, are, that are obviously related to the Azores. Even in the other ones, there is some <laughs> Azorean bits and pieces and we appreciate you for that. Oh, thank you. Appreciate you very much too. Thank you so much, my friend. And thanks to all of you for joining us. On behalf of the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute at California State University, Fresno, uh, thank you for joining in the PBBI FLAD uh, lectures and conference and literary series for 2023. Our guest has been Michael Garcia Spring, his book uh, right here, uh, uh, Bilingual. And uh, again, if you don't mind, uh, Michael, showing us your chapbook again. And uh, uh, so folks can see that. That's his latest uh, chapbook. And we can get that so they can order that. Is that available? Yes, it is. Yeah, you can order it um, uh, from Survision books um okay. online or you can uh, get a hold of me directly okay through facebook or something or uh I, I can, yeah i'll send you a copy too sure okay, <laughs> in the united so. states will be cheaper i think <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um you can get it directly from the publisher as well or from mm -hmm. you okay all right yeah. Uh, do support our Portuguese American poets, our Portuguese American artists. Please do all the time, get, buy their books and appreciate their creativity. Again, thank you so much, Michael. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everyone.